So in today's video, we're going to solve Fermat's last theorem. Well, not really. We're going to solve it for polynomials. Let's first recall what Fermat's last theorem even is outside of the context of polynomials. It asks to solve the following equation, a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for integers a, b, c, where they don't have a common factor, and n is a positive integer. Now, n equals 1, we have many solutions, and n equals 2, we get solutions by Pythagorean theorem. So any triangle with integer side lengths um, that's right angle will give us a Pythagorean triple. And it turns out for n greater than 3, there's no solution. This is a big open problem in mathematics that was solved by Andrew Wiles in the 1990s. And so what we're going to do is solve this problem for polynomials where the polynomials have complex coefficients. Now, when n is 1, we can always set, given any f and g, we can set h to be the sum of f and g, and then we'll have a solution. So we get many solutions when n is 1. Now, for n is 2, we actually get many solutions too, and they're kind of inspired by a Pythagorean theorem, but in a kind of interesting way. So let's set f of x to be x squared minus the square of any number. Okay, then x, minus, x squared minus a squared squared, that's f squared, is x squared my, or x to the fourth minus 2a squared x squared plus a to the fourth. Okay, now if we add in the quantity 2ax all squared, then that negative 2a squared x squared will become a positive 2a squared x squared. So if we set g of x to be 2ax, then this will work out to add to x to the fourth plus 2a squared x squared plus a to the fourth, which is x squared plus a squared all squared. So we do have families of solutions when n is 2. Okay, and we'll set h of x to that x squared plus a squared, and we get that solution. So now, remembering that we're thinking about polynomials over the complex numbers, the question is what happens when n is a little larger? So our claim is that just like in Fermat's last theorem, there's no solution when n is a positive integer that is at least 3. So we can't find functions f, g, and h that have no common factors. Like you can always get a solution by setting f to 0 and g and h equal, right? So we're going to assume there's no common factors between any pair of them. Um, then in that case, we're going to show that there's no solution whatsoever. So it's like having firm as last theorem for polynomials, but we're going to actually prove this in this short video here. So it's surprising that even though for integers this problem is really difficult, for complex polynomials is actually not that bad. Now the question is how do we actually proceed? Um, so one of the things we're going to do is reduce the problem to looking at when n is prime. And then we're going to think about factorizing the left-hand side, noticing that it's a sum of nth powers, um, in a way that's reasonably achievable using the fact that we're dealing with complex numbers. So any complex polynomial of a given degree can factor into linear polynomials. Um, we're going to use that as motivation to factor that left-hand side that we have. Now I want to emphasize how really amazing this thing is. Like, Fermat's last theorem for integers took Andrew Wiles like seven years to prove. So surprising that we can prove this so quick. Okay, so we'll prove again that it's impossible for primes. And why does that give us what we want? Well, say we had a positive integer that's not a prime, right? And we, for contradiction, had a solution. So we had complex polynomials f, g, and h, where f to the n plus g to the n is h to the n. Okay, then we'd actually pick any prime that divides n, then we'd have actually a solution for um, the exponent that is that prime, right? Because we can take f to the n over p and raise to the p plus g to the n over p raised to the p equaling h to the n over p raised to the p. So if we can get this for primes, well, this is impossible for primes if our claim is uh, true. So if we can get this, the fact that we have no solutions for primes, then we'll get no solutions um, for positive integers in general. By using this process right here, that would reduce for general integers what happens with primes. Okay, so erasing all that, let's think about what happens now 
for prime numbers. So we'll set n to be p is just to, to remind ourselves that n is actually prime. We'll use p as the label for that prime. Okay, so we have h to the p is f to the p plus g to the p. And again, like I mentioned, f to the p plus g to the p actually factors into a bunch of factors. We get f plus zeta g, where zeta is a primitive root of unity, times f plus zeta squared g, all the way to f plus zeta to the p minus 1 g. And then we're also missing a factor here, which is f plus g. So there should be an f plus g factor here as well. And here zeta is a complex number whose p is power is 1. Okay, so uh, let's argue something that's going to be useful for us in this proof. So we have all these different factors. We're going to claim that any pair of factors actually has no common complex polynomial factors themselves. So let's take two of them, like f plus zeta to the ig and f plus zeta to the j, jg. If we subtract these two, we get zeta to the i minus zeta to the j times the polynomial g. Okay, so if there's a common factor between f plus zeta to the ig and f plus zeta to the jg, then that would be a factor of g itself because zeta to the i minus zeta to the j times g is a constant times g itself. Okay. Now, using a sort of a similar tactic, let's take f plus zeta to the i g and um, augment and see if we can get that we get a forced factor of f somehow. Okay, so we'll multiply f plus zeta to the i g by zeta to the j and subtract zeta to the i times f plus zeta to the j g. The reason to do that is we'll have constant factors times the g's that factor out, um, or subtract out. So we're left with zeta to the j minus zeta to the i times f. Okay, so if f plus zeta to the i g and f plus zeta to the jg had a common factor, it would be a common factor of f as well. So the greatest common factor, thinking of factors of complex polynomials of f plus zeta to the ig and f plus zeta to the jg, is the same as the greatest common factor of f and g themselves. Um, and we said that f and g have no common factors. This is an assumption in our problem. So all these complex polynomials on the right including the one that's missing that should have been written down, which is f plus g, have no common factors. Okay, um, so let's look at a solution to this equation, h to the p plus equals f to the p plus g to the p, where the degree of f plus the degree of g is as small as we possibly can have among all the solutions to blank to the p plus equals blank to the p plus blank to the p where all the blanks are polynomials. We're going to contradict that you can even select such a minimal solution and so there can't possibly be solutions. So we'll pick this solution that's minimal and let's look at all of these factors. So f plus zeta g is a polynomial itself and has no common factors with the polynomials all on the right. So there must be polynomials for which all of the polynomials underlined on the right are p -th powers of them. For example, f plus zeta g has to be some polynomial raised to the p. Because when we factor it all out, its factors have to be factors of the right, left-hand side, which are powers of p, and there are no common factors between any of the polynomials on the right. So similarly, f plus zeta squared g is a power of some complex polynomial of p -th power. And then f plus g, which should have been on the right-hand side of the equation that we have as a factor, is also going to be a p -th power of some polynomial. And we're going to show that this is actually a problem. Um, and the way we're going to show is we're going to generate another solution to the, the equation blank to the p equals blank to the p plus blank to the p, where the sum of the degrees of the things 
involved are less than what we had before. And the way we're going to see that is by taking 1 plus zeta and multiplying it by r to the p. If we do that, we get 1 plus zeta times f plus zeta g, right, which we can actually then express in terms of f plus g and f plus zeta squared g. So we get f and we get plus zeta squared g, and then the inner terms of the expansion are zeta f plus zeta g. Okay, so this thing here, f plus zeta squared g, is t, or s itself, or s to the p, and zeta f plus zeta g is zeta t to the p. So we can rewrite this equation as saying that 1 plus zeta r to the p plus negative zeta t to the p equals s to the p. Now we're working over complex numbers. So these underlying coefficients are actually pth powers of complex numbers themselves. So we can absorb them into r and we get a polynomial r prime to the p plus a polynomial t prime to the p is s to the p. And now the thing is, if we look at r prime and t prime, they have the same degrees as r and t. And as a consequence, the degree of r prime plus t prime is going to be less than the degree of f plus the degree of g um, because of the equations that we have and the fact that f plus zeta g is a, r to a pth power similarly with f plus zeta g squared g. Okay, so that pretty much resolves our issue. Where did the p equals equaling a prime at least three come in, but well, we wouldn't have had these three different factors if our prime, well, our number wasn't our prime greater than three. And then the fact that p is greater than three gives us the degree argument as well, because r prime and t prime will have a degree that is smaller than one third the maximum degree of f or g themselves. So a really cool solution to the problem of Fermat's last theorem extended beyond integers to polynomials, which is shocking because the integer case required seven years to prove, and the polynomial case can be proved in a nice video like this.